Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Life Sciences Living Room Conversation. I'm your host for today. My name is Stefan Keller. Um, I'm Catalyst at Life Sciences, and I will guide you through the session today. Um, as always, we have one hour, and we want to have a good conversation to create insights, um, to inspire each other, and to um, just be creative during the conversation and make sure we get um, good ideas to follow up on. And uh, today is the 57th session, and I'm going to be hosting Tom and Fanny today, and we will discuss the topic of working with source. Um, we already had a great get to know before. I think it's going to be a very interesting topic also from my end. So this session is for me <laughs> to learn something from them. And it's um, for you also to um, learn more about the source and how to implement it in a day-to-day -day, um, basis maybe. And for this also, feel free to uh, type in any um, any questions you might have, any comments in the chat. We will make sure to pick them up and let them flow into the conversation. Other than that, we're going to have a laid back conversation and see where the topic is leading us. And with this, I would like to stop my monologue here. And first of all, um, introduce our two guests today, um, Tom and Fanny. And I will leave it up to you who wants to start. If you could give us a brief introduction. Do you want to go first, Tom? Yeah, sure. Hey, everybody. Happy to be here. Thank you, Stefan. Um, yeah, so I'm Tom Nixon. Um, I'm the author of the book Work With Source. I work as a coach and advisor, mostly to founders who are trying to do something purposeful in the world and have this um, these principles around source, which we're going to unpack um, through the course of this conversation at the heart of my work. I'm also the founder of Maptio, which is an open source software product that helps you map out initiatives, organizational um, collaborations that aren't based on traditional management hierarchy. So that's me. How about you, Fanny? Uh, yeah, my name is Fanny Norlin. Um, I'm a business consultant. Um, yeah, my most of my career has been focused on decentralized organizing, and uh, my passion is creating um, organizations and initiatives where people feel really alive, like vibrant. Um, yeah, I've been uh, working as a, a consultant, entrepreneur, um, business leader in organizations. Um, and uh, I've also been working with, or I have known Tom for nine years or something. And um, the work with Source, or working with Source was one of the, um, yeah, was one of those like huge shifts for me that really, deepened and enhanced and unleashed a lot of things for me when it comes to uh, decentralized organizing. So I'm really happy to be here as well. Thank you very much both. Um, so I think what's connecting us is decentral ways of working and human centric ways of working. Um, and some of our viewers maybe have also seen your fireside conversation during Teal Around the World. And um, during Teal Around the World, there were a few things that you mentioned that really um, that, that got me, that got my attention because I, I see how you were talking about how people um, maybe were a bit hesitant at first with working with the source and accepting that there is a source. And I was one of these people. So I was very happy um, to also hear your conversation. And for me also working with source has become um, a more important topic and I'm more open to it and try to see it also in my day-to-day -day life. Um, I guess that some people maybe have not um, heard about the source yet necessarily working with the source. So maybe before we start diving into how does it really look then in, the, in, in real life scenarios, could you give us a quick wrap up, like in a nutshell, what is it? What is working with source about? What's special about it? Yeah, sure. and first I just wanted to say I really appreciate your open mindedness, Stefan. And also <laughs> I can relate because when I first learned about this, it jarred with me too. So this is quite a common reaction when people first learn this. And I'm sure this will happen for some people who are hearing this um, for the first time. But I'll try and give you the shortest version I can to get us started, and then we'll unpack it and go into it as we as we see fit. Um, so I think probably many of the people who are gathered here listening listening to this are interested in organizations, right? So how can we create better organizations, one that aren't based on traditional bureaucratic and dehumanizing power over 
um, kind of hierarchies and how we can create the kinds of organizations that can get something purposeful and worthwhile done in the world. And people talk about the new paradigms in organizations. And obviously the Bible of that world was reinventing organizations nearly 10 years ago now. Crazy, huh? Um, and actually what I want to offer you is something that's very compatible with these conversations around different ways of organizing, but actually it's a very different perspective. And it was one that was created by my really good friend and teacher, Peter Koenig, who lives in, in Zurich. And where Peter got started was he very simply noticed that many people start all kinds of initiatives. So any company or nonprofit or activist movement you could think of, at some point, someone had an idea to do something, to bring something new into the world or to or to change something. So ultimately, underneath all of this stuff around creating an organization, there was a creative process. So purpose comes first. So purpose is not fundamentally an artifact of the organization. And that's the big shift, because what you notice, even in the, the very kind of fashionable discussions around teal organizations, people are still talking about organizations, whereas actually where we're coming from is really just about creativity. And where this starts, when we have this different paradigm, if we say it starts with purpose and purpose doesn't come from the organization, in fact, we could even say that the organization as an entity doesn't even really exist. It's just a story that's being um, unfolded into the world. So where does the purpose come from? And the answer very simply is it comes from a person. So at some point, if you go back in time with any initiative you could think of, um, including the initiative to run these, these live streams, there was a moment where it hadn't started yet. And then somebody somewhere took the initiative to actually invest themselves in making an idea happen. And that's the starting point. And from that moment, that creative act of starting something from nothing, a creative initiative un unfolded. And in particular, the, the core principle at the start of this that Peter uncovered was that in any human initiative, from parties to companies to cooking a meal, having a dinner party, anything you can think of, there is exactly one individual that Peter gave the name in, as being in the role of source. So this very unique role that one individual holds. Um, so the creative process is intimately tied to them. It's tied to the energy they have for that idea. It's very much tied to their personality for better and for worse, which gives us a lot of clues about why things um, turn toxic or, or are very healthy and, and generative. Um, and they have an intimate connection to that creative process. So they have an intuitive sense that's different to anybody else about what the edges of this thing is. So what's in and what's out and what the next step for the initiative as a whole is. And so that principle around there being one source, that's often where a lot of people in the teal world will say, you are the devil, purpose is shared. You can't have one individual who's special, especially if it's just something that emerged naturally. I'm parodying here, but it's kind of true. <laughs> this, is, this is exactly how I felt, I have to say. This was exactly yeah. my initial thinking. Like, this cannot be, we're all the same. Um, only then digging deeper into the topic made me realize yeah. that there's actually a lot of value in accepting this uh, idea of source and then also working with this idea. Um, yeah. Sorry, Fanny, I think you wanted to say something. No, I just, just left. In. Okay. <laughs> um, so the, the question for me is how, like, how to identify the source, especially if you say you, know, you have this resistance, especially in small companies where then yeah. there's also co-founders. Um, how do you identify the source? What's the key to it? Yeah, well, the first thing to say is, is to be curious about where that resistance comes from. So what I've noticed, particularly in the conversations around decentralized organizing, teal organizations and so on, there's many people who have a very understandable allergy to anything that's top down and hierarchical. And it's understandable because we've seen so many really shit hierarchical systems, power over people, dehumanizing, slow bureaucracy. You know, you guys know all of that, all of that stuff. So people are very wary about anything that seems um, hierarchical but then what they do is they go to the opposite extreme and say everything must be decentralized if there is a purpose it must be a shared purpose and we all co-steward it and that's there's something very noble about that in, intention to be very um, collectivist but actually where Peter was coming from when he started to clarify these source principles which was not something new that he invented but he just helped to describe what just seems to naturally happen with humans as they work together to bring ideas to life is he noticed that if you look really carefully and most importantly, honestly, you can identify that there was one person who took that first step. 
And that's the, the, the first way that you can identify which individual is in the role of source, is the historical perspective. So who was the first person who took the first risk, the first vulnerable step that invested themselves in realizing some kind of idea? They put something on the line because they might have failed. They might have invited somebody else in to say, will you help me do this? And maybe that collaboration doesn't work out. So there's always some sort of vulnerable step, vulnerable risk and that person is the source um even if there are seemingly very equal co-founders at the beginning and again this can be challenging for many people because it's a very popular story to say we are the co-founders and we started it together and it's ours jointly or they would say ah we we get source but we're all jointly sources and and i would say if that's people's worldview you're entitled to your own sense making lens so i'm not here to tell you you're fundamentally wrong this is not a scientific theory that we can falsify um through the scientific method but it's 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 in a sense making lens and actually people tend to get there eventually so myself included probably funny as well but you can speak for yourself and maybe maybe you as well stefan and um and i think it'll be the case for many people listening so I'm not going to tell anybody that they're wrong they should, or that they shouldn't see things in other ways. But what I would say is that if you want to operate, you know, at a, at a high level in a very complex world, it helps to have more than one sense making perspective. So even if you like the idea of shared purpose and joint co-founders and all of that kind of group centered um, stuff, just keep in your back pocket that there's an alternative that is a way of reintegrating the individual and the hierarchical, but in a way that doesn't have to be toxic. Um, and we can talk about how to do this well and in a healthy way um, in a moment. But let me, yeah, let, me let me just pause there. <laughs> See what's coming up for you. Thanks. Um, I like I like how you phrase it very openly and also give room for different um, kinds of approaches and how to merge them. Um, and it's also how I took it in a sense to see then just to see where does it work like on everyday example where do I see that the source. Um, source idea could help me out um, with certain aspects and I know that also a lot of people are listening in that are working for big corporates mm. and I think from a perspective like our company small company um, it's it's easier I would say to relate to the source idea but now thinking of a big corporate with uh, 50 60 thousand um, employees mm. how does the source idea change or does it at all change in this environment and how is it potentially also scalable yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. And there are sort of two sides to this, really. The first is that even for really large and really old initiatives, like, like many big corporations, they still have a founding story. And it can be fascinating to dig into them because often they're lost and, and not talked about. Um, you know, an, an example I think we talked about at the Teal Around the World chat, if I remember rightly, was the, the story of Unilever. So obviously an enormous multi, multinational, and it was started by William Lever. He was the source, and, and he had a vision about bringing hygiene and sanitation to the world, which is still an ongoing um, project, but obviously particularly bad. I can't remember how many hundred years ago he, he set it up. But there is there was a source and it's interesting that there's something in the dna of unilever and obviously we can critique it in many ways um as a com as a company and that's fair that's fair game but there was something in its dna that it was trying to do something or that william lever was trying to do something constructive and actually when paul pullman took over as ceo i heard someone from Unilever to give a speech about this. They talked about how he went through this process that he called walking in William Lever's shoes. So he kind of stalked this guy's ghost to try and get to the essence of what this thing was and perhaps some form of succession of source because the role of source can be passed from one person to another. Um, there are a bunch of principles around that, but it's I, I would say that Paul Pullman was the source of Unilever. And as far as corporates go, I think he he was, you know, in a better place than many corporate CEOs, I think, especially if you look at the work he's done done since. Um, so yes, yeah, so it does still it does still apply, but what's happened in many corporates is over the course of time, the, there hasn't been a clear succession of source. The founders have, have left, they've maybe floated on stock exchanges. You've got boards of directors and shareholders who are supposedly holding the power, which they do from a legal and financial perspective, mm. but they don't necessarily from a purpose and creative perspective. So the most common thing you see in corporates is 
they're not really following purpose. It can be a bit of purpose washing going on. They're following an alternative ideology, which is the ideology of shareholder value and making making a profit. So that's the, the real struggle there. But I think as Paul Pullman showed, even 100 years later, there is potential to reconnect. Um, and going back to the founding and going back to the not just thinking about the company being founded, but who, who was the person? Because creativity comes from people, not from organizations. Um, and you might be able to pick up the threads again from there. And then the second way before I before I pause is that even if you are lost in a big sprawling corporation or, or nonprofit NGO, you can still work with source on your own sort of smaller scale. So it, the same principles apply all the way from the outer edge of the whole initiative to the more specific projects and initiatives that are running. So anyone working inside any um, initiative will be a member of different projects and different teams. So you can start asking the question, who did this come from? Yeah. And, and was it me? And if so, gosh, it was me. So I'm the source and I can have a different frame to not just say, well, I'm a project lead or I'm a team member or a co-steward. I can just say, I'm the source of this. It came from me. What was I trying to do in the world? And that shift can be quite powerful around how people take responsibility, how they're, um, how they're accountable for what they do. So you can just start looking at it in this more sort of uh, outward, um, sort of inside out kind of way, rather than worrying about the really big picture of source. So those are a couple of thoughts, yeah. Thank you, Tom. Um, just, Fanny, I will get to, to you in a second. Just one, one follow up question on this one is, so we said that there could be can be various sources and also within the company, right? Different initiatives have different sources then. Mm. Um, what does a source need to be effective? Yeah. And also then from as an organization, what can I do organizationally to uh, um, create a system that nudges these sources to be strong sources? Yeah. So this is great. So this is, I'll, I'll share one way. I mean, maybe this is a great way of bringing, bringing you in, feminine, uh, Fanny, for the masculine and feminine perspective, which I found an incredibly helpful addition to this work, which is why we're doing a lot of stuff together. Um, so in brief, there are sort of two main tensions that are any source for any initiative. And you can think about, you know, really relate this to yourself rather than just as a theoretical framework, because even if you're not the originating founder or the source the initiative you spend most of your time in you will be for something in your in your life some kind of project or initiative in or out of work but the the tensions that you will you will face is firstly one between clarity and doubt so one very reassuring thing i learned from peter koenig is he said the chronic state of a source where they spend most of their time is doubt they're just not knowing uh, or as my colleague Ria Bach um, says, not knowing yet um, what the edge of this thing is. Is this thing in or is it out? Like, what, what is this thing? What's the shape of it? Where's the boundary? Um, and sitting with that doubt, as well as the doubt about what the next step is. Are we going this way or that, or that way with this whole thing? So a good source will be able to sit with that doubt, which is very different from this mythology around hero visionary founders that just, you know, like the caricatures of Steve Jobs, for example, that he could just see the future and he just knew what needed to be created, which is actually not true even in his case, as his biography shows, he got it wrong many times. Um, but sitting with the doubt, but then at the same time, knowing that the clarity comes to them, not to the group and not to anybody else, um, but they often need to do a lot of listening and being patient not taking difficult to reverse decisions while they are while they're unclear. So riding that polarity between clarity and doubt is the first. And the second is the polarity between being top down and bottom up. And again, this is a real hot topic for people who are organizational geeks like us. Um, because there's this story that top down is old school and bad and we need to get rid mm. of it. And that bottom up, decentralized, that's modern and good. And that's how everything should be. And that's overly simplistic. And we even see this from sort of ancient history and, and anthropology that humans have always found ways to navigate working in and organizing in more top down ways and more bottom up ways. And at different times, different ones are appropriate. It's that lovely story in David Graeber's book. Um, what's it called? Is it a history, a brief history of everything? I've probably got that slightly wrong. 
but where he talked about this archaic tribe where they had two organizational structures in the tribe. In one season, they would be top down, controlled by the chief. And that was during the, I think that was in the dry season when resources were much more scarce. And the top down centrality of the um, of the chief running everything helped the tribe stay together and it meant they could all survive. And then as soon as that season was over and they were in the rainy season where the things were growing and it was easy, the chief just let go and just said, right, we're, we're just decentralized and we're bottom up now. So, and that's what a good source will do. They're not afraid to be top down, to be, even be a dictator when, it, when, when they need to be, and they know how to let go and to be decentralized. And that's the big level up which gets lost in a lot of these discussions about Teal, because Teal is supposed to be about integrating all the parts that came before. But what's really happening, if most people are honest, they're still reacting against this hierarchical, individualistic orange. They're not integrating it. Um, so, yeah, so those are the two tensions, top down and bottom up and clarity and doubt. But yeah, do you want to react to that? And, and then maybe Fanny can bring in the message. Yeah, exactly. Make the bridge to, to Fanny. Um, I, first of all, I fully agree. I think especially this misperception that there is no space for um, um, to command and control in a teal environment. Um, and I think this, the, the analogy with the tribe put it quite nicely, as also now we see that in crisis mode, you want to be very fast, and very directive, and very focused. And then yeah. it makes sense maybe to switch mode, as long as it's transparent. And there is a, for me, it's important that there is a, um, a time frame connected to it. It's not that this is now we switch mode completely. And for now on, we are always command and control. But in this environment, for this purpose, or this period of time, we switch to this type of leadership, um, I think makes a lot of sense. And I like the way how you your tendency to integrate different perspectives, as I think this is really um, adding the value if we see the synergies in those um, those different perspectives as well. And this now brings me also to these polarities um, that, that we often see it's either one or the other. Turns out it's both kind of, and yeah. it really depends. The consulting answer, it depends. <laughs> and uh, maybe Fanny, if you could tell us a bit about um, like, how does leadership change with this source, this idea of source, and what are potential polarities also that we see um, within this role? Uh, how does leadership change? <laughs> um, uh, I mean, um, I think one interesting like aspect of of source is that it's um it's like a lens on the organization like it's it's there um regardless if you acknowledge it or not like there is there is there just seems to be somebody who is holding this connection to the creative vision and then people who have stepped in to help that person and then people who have stepped in to help those people and there is this um creative uh, hierarchy so to say it becomes a bit paradoxical to say like how does source affect leadership because it's it's like um I don't know how does living affect living you know like it's it's just there um but then there can of course be um maybe you can call it like a, a weak source or or that that the how the source shows up as tom was saying really affects the field that this source has is holding um and depending on if that field is being held well or not um it will affect that initiative um yeah and maybe is there like to now to again trying to implement it now knowing okay the idea of source is important maybe even realizing i am the source or my my line manager is the source what would be a good conclusion out of it in terms of how do how does it change behavior or maybe also not or what is a good behavior for a source within the organization mm. Yeah, so maybe I could take that one because this was a key part of how we how we really integrated Fanny's work on on masculine and feminine um, archetypes as well. So really, really concretely, if in doubt, a source should fall back on listening. And so, you know, and that's that doesn't sound very um, that doesn't sound very new. People always say good leaders should listen, but fundamentally, this is not about leadership, and that's why I really agree with what what Fanny was talking about just then. This is fundamentally about how you can be creative, how you can bring something new into the world. It's not about at its heart about leading other people or leading an organization. Um, but if you're in that creative process, you need to listen, and that listening can be sort of an, an outward. 
opening. So listening to the information that's around you, listening to colleagues, maybe the collective intelligence of the people that you're working with, which is where we can really integrate the more collective and decentralized element because the collective intelligence you can get from a group is often going to be far greater than any one individual source alone. So they can listen to that. They can really listen to what is the world asking for from us or from me. Um, but it's also inward listening to remind themselves that they started this thing as a human um, and to say, like, what was this about for me? Why did I take the initiative? Or if it was a succession, why did I take this, this precious role of source from somebody, somebody else? What am I trying to express? What's my need and what's my values in all of this? So listening is a really important set of skills and practice to, to cultivate. The second, there are four of these, the second is hosting. So, um, and that relates again to the collective intelligence process. So often you can't do all of this alone. So hosting collective processes to either to get clear or to find new ways to organize or to create forums where people can say, okay, we can get a sense of what the whole is. Now, what about all the hundred projects that need to happen to realize the whole thing? So hosting is a really important one. Um, and then we have delegating, which you touched on uh, earlier, Stefan, which is that, yes, there's one source for the, for the whole, but there can be many specific sources where all the same principles apply, but just to a specific domain within it. So for what Peter called a sub initiative to do one more specific part of the overall effort. So hosting processes where people can say, yeah, this thing over here, I'll do that. And they take responsibility for it. And maybe that causes them to spin up a team or a circle, depending what language they're using. But still underneath that, they've become a source because they've started to create something out of nothing. Um, so that process of yeah, allowing this decentralization, this delegation is really needed. And then finally, the fourth is deciding. So they actually have to make decisions. They have to make calls about what is in and what's, and what's out. So again, this is back in the top-down realm. Because if, and this is a thing you will see going wrong in teal-inspired initiatives, is that they allow anything in. If someone's got the, the energy for it, they go, well, it has to be okay. And, and slowly they do more and more things and you get this kind of creative entropy effect mm. where the thing grinds to a halt, it loses all coherence. So sometimes you need that top down um, to say, actually, that's a great idea that you've got, but maybe you should do that as a side project. Or maybe your calling is to leave or join somewhere else to do this thing that's meaningful to you because it doesn't fit here. But where this really segues into the masculine feminine work, and it was funny who I credit for this because she pointed it out to me, is those, those four behaviours, um, so listening, hosting, delegating, deciding, those, those fit a particular kind of masculine archetype that's often missing from our initiatives. We often, masculine energy gets a bad rap often, you know, particularly in the age of Me Too and all the conversations around toxic masculinity. But masculinity is not inherently good or bad. It can do good or bad. But often what's missing is this particular quality of masculinity. And, you know, I'd love to hand over to Fanny because she explains this much better than I can and knows it well. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to, to? I'm worried that we're bringing in even more layers of complexity, but maybe maybe people can handle it. We'll Please see. Can handle it. It's, <laughs> it's a complex world. We need to accept yeah, it. So <laughs> like, when people are like processing the source concept, here comes another <laughs> another big chunk of thing for you yeah. to process. But but it is really fascinating. Um, and, and in a sense, it's kind of. Um, the source uh, work and the masculine feminine work, like the, the lineages and work that I bring in from masculine feminine are kind of, I see it looking from the same kind of lens or paradigm. And that's why they're quite fascinating about really this thing about truly transcending and including. Um, so what, what Tom started to speak about was, um, so my story is, is I've been in really deep into decentralized leadership, um, you know, uh, I met Tom on the on one of the first like online forums for the Reinventing Organizations book, like the first first nerds who were like first on the book <laughs> to read it. That's where I met Tom. Um, but anyways, and as I said, working with Source was one of those big like, oh, like, OK, this is this so much clears up so many of the tensions and the and, and the challenges with actually practicing uh, and, and getting this to work. 
um, in reality. And the second one of these big realizations was, was me when I took Louise Alcian's course, Awakening Feminine Leadership, I think six years ago now. And I got really deep in touch with, um, with what I now call the creating feminine or actually the feminine as a whole. But I, I, I got in touch with aspects of the feminine that, um, that were, um, yeah, that I weren't really embodying or I, I came home to, to, to the fullness of the feminine. And when I did that, also I saw how kind of the masculine in relation to my feminine at, at work and another constellation started showing up differently. And what I, what I noticed was that um, we talk about that the feminine and the masculine are in polarity with, with each other, that like we often talk about that. The, the, I mean, if you Google masculine and feminine leadership, you'll get that the masculine is like um, maybe egoistic, decisive, driven, action taken. Um, and the feminine is like uh, nurturing, uh, embracing, um, like uh, slowing down, listening. And that's a polarity. Uh, and that is a polarity within the masculine and the feminine. What I realized is that there's actually a very strong polarity within the masculine. So there is this kind of maybe what we traditionally see as masculine that I call the creating masculine. So the the um, the driven, executing, uh, forward driving um, masculine. But then there's also the holding masculine, which is much of the masculine that, that Tom was describing. Um, this and the energy of, of that masculine is more maybe like a, a stable mountain or a tree, like truly, truly grounded and really, really present and really listening, both really present and listening and also creating like the clarity and the direction. Um, and when it comes to the feminine, we do have this kind of unifying feminine that I call the holding feminine. So it is this feminine that that keeps the group together, that 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 um, takes in a lot of different perspectives and unifies. But that's only half of the cycle of the feminine. And the other half I call the creating feminine, which is the, um, you know, it's like the Kali, it's the life force, it's the it's the seductress, it's the um, uh, powerful, uh, life creating, um, feminine. And what I realized is that in most organizations in general, um, in most organizations, there's a lot of like excess in this excess and an unguided creating masculine, um, like in the world at large, there's a lot of like execution forward driving and it's in excess. Um, and it's lacking the hold, the guiding from the holding masculine. Mm. And, and, and especially, you know, like in teal, Decentralized places, we talk about that we need more of the feminine, but the only feminine that we know of is half of the cycle is this unifying feminine, which is maybe like this green, if you would use Lalu's models, maybe it's like, um, you know, infusing more green into the orange. Uh, and then there's this kind of green orange mix that, that, that we call teal. Um, but what happens is that uh, when the holding feminine doesn't have access to the creating feminine, the holding feminine doesn't have access to her power, to her life force. So it rather becomes a quite disempowered, almost collapsed version of the feminine that is more like, like gasping for breath and like trying to get this executing masculine to slow down and like, stop, wait, we have to like, it's going too fast. We're burning up the planet. Um, and then there's just this tension between this, um, maybe a bit boyish, you could say, executing um, mas masculine and like a collapsed, maybe mothering um, feminine. And uh, when actually when it works really well is that there's a strong, vibrant, creating feminine that is like infusing the life force and like connecting us to the creative energy of the initiative. And then that calls in the holding masculine to kind of hold space for that. And then there's a collaboration between the creating feminine and the holding masculine that creates this deep sense of um, direction that is not like a, it's not a collective purpose or it's, it's just like a deep sense of knowing like what really wants to come alive right now and what would really, you know, serve what like or just what is true like what is really wanting to come alive and when that clear when when the executing or creating masculine has that clear direction then that um energy is free to really like just manifest and create and when the holding feminine is empowered by by the creating feminine there can be a really really cool collaboration also between the holding feminine and the creating masculine where they can like support each other because they're not neither of them are like collapsed or toxic 
and then bringing this all the way back to source, um, what's, what the perspective does, um, Peter's perspective um, um, working with source is that it highlights exactly this collaboration between the creating feminine and the holding masculine. Um, that is basically working with source like that, that, um, I mean, Tom, Tom can tell you more about this, but like in his book, he talks about like that it is this source compass is part of it, like what I would call the holding masculine, these these um, qualities that, that Tom described. But then there's also the, what, what you're listening to is the creating feminine. Um, so like what you're listening to is this life force and what you're... Yeah, like it's kind of... Um, Tom talks about, I really like that, of seeing like spirituality is either spirituality through me or as me where like the masculine holding masculine version of source is through me and the feminine version is as me so like the, the creating feminine is is the source and mm. the holding feminine um uh, 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 yeah you understand what I mean? like it embodies or mm. um steps into the role of maybe something like that Okay, that was, that was a big download. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. I love seeing you in flow like that. <laughs> thank you. First of all, I see the passion, which is amazing just to listen. Um, and also, thank you for the wrap-up. I, I think it's not too, if, if you hear this for the first time, maybe also for the um, uh, viewers and listeners, it's not easy to grasp, but definitely if you go through it step by step, and I think you did this quite nicely, it, it makes sense. There is a there is a, a good comprehensiveness behind. And I know that you also wrote a nice article about it. So maybe also mm -hmm. we can share the article in the comments. And as this really, at least for me, this was a really good access to understand the bigger concept. And I fully agree with what you've just said. Um, it connects well also to one question that came in from Ian um, a few minutes ago. And it was about um, toxicity of a source and you mm -hmm. just said you know there needs to be this balance and we can we want to expect that all sources are super reflected and well balanced and they know exactly what to do and when to switch into which polarity but in reality it's often not the case and maybe also sometimes they are resistant to advice to reflect and grow into these um, polarities that that the source brings with it what is a good, like, how to, how to handle these situations? Is it possible to, to keep it alive with this toxic source? So does it make sense to change the source? So what would you suggest in such a situation? Yeah. This, is, this is such a great question. And, you know, sometimes when people hear about source, you know, one pushback I had recently where somebody said, oh, but so this sounds really patriarchal and it's built on patriarchy. And it's like, well... If you've got a patriarchal context and you've got a source who embodies a patriarchal mindset attitude, then in the field that they establish, it's going to be patriarchal. But the same principles apply to matriarchal initiatives or, you know, to any or to anarchist initiatives, even, even though they probably hate this, this idea. But anything that anarchists do, someone still had to start whatever the thing is. Um, so there is a so source is always there and you will get whatever the source brings to it. And yeah, and sometimes we find ourselves in the in the field of a source that is displaying some toxic um, behaviors, maybe some there's some sort of tyranny um, happening there. And the first thing to say is, unfortunately, you can't just take take the source off them. It's a bit like saying to an artist, just saying, yeah, we, we don't like the way you're producing your art. So we, we're we now declaring that you're not the artist of your art anymore. We would know that that wouldn't make sense. And, that, and that's because it's you can't take someone's own creative process away from them. You can steal their paints and their easel, perhaps, and make it harder for them. And sometimes that's needed. You, you know, there's a long history of sabotage in toxic initiatives, Um so you can do that, but but what needs to happen here is not just this deference to the source. So what people will sometimes think is, you know, this is all about this one one person, which they sometimes imagine it being a being a guy, and he's you know in charge of of everything. And on the one hand, it's true that there is one person, obviously not necessarily a guy. There is one person who's holding the whole and has this very special, different relationship that we can acknowledge. But one of the most powerful things we can all do is acknowledge the source that's within all of us. So we can be part of collectives and we can join something that someone else has started. But we all have our own agency. And that's really important. And that's what so often gets destroyed under under tyranny is people do lose their agency. And if you look in history about how tyranny has been overthrown, you know, often there's somebody, you know, maybe one of the iconic people. I don't know, Rosa Parks, perhaps, who just said, 
no, I'm going to take a stand for something different because they were following their own instincts, you know, and in Rosa Parks's case and in Fanny's language, she was embodying what the world needed, which was, you know, a world without this horrific oppression that was happening at that at that time. And, and I'm going to manifest that by taking this risk of sitting in this place on this bus. And then, you know, we all know, you know, how that went down in history. So that's really important if you find yourself mm -hmm. in these places. And even if you're a specific source inside somebody else's initiative, you know, what Peter always said was that your, your number one loyalty should be to your own sense of purpose, to what you are sourcing, you know, what you're trying to embody that the world needs from the feminine perspective or what you feel is coming through you like a channel from whatever spiritual realm you, you believe in and prioritize that and let that guide your next step. And that could lead you sometimes to, to leave the initiative or maybe even start a movement to say, why don't we all leave and we'll do our thing without the source? So in effect, the source then loses all their, they don't really have any power over anybody if everyone says they're, they're mm. leaving. Um, or you might say, yeah, I'm going to stay, but I'm going to sabotage this thing. Great. If that's what your calling is saying and you're clear, then, then maybe that's what needs to happen. So, yeah, those are some ways to approach it. It's a very different way of looking at it, huh? Yeah, thank you. Then the short answer is anarchy. That's what I, that's what I guess. <laughs> <laughs> if the sauce is toxic, then call out the anarchy. I'd say rebellion rather than throw, anarchy. Throw it over, yeah. Yeah, rebellion is uh, needed. Maybe one thing to add, and I don't know if that's already kind of in there, but also it's just like to mirror, to mirror the source in, uh, in what you're seeing. Because mm. mm. um, sometimes, I mean, if... if uh, this, the, the source's biggest work is to kind of, you know, re reclaim parts of their identity or work with, with themselves to be a better source. And, and that's one of the things you really, really need other people for as a source to mirror you and to help you understand how you can be in the role better. Mm. And maybe this topic that Fanny and I and other colleagues have been talking about recently about ego. Mm. So ego, people in the teal world, they love talking about ego and how you've got to let go of your ego and how ego is the, the bad, the bad thing. And I'm always fascinated by that because an, an ego is just a, a part of the human psyche. You know, you can't actually be human. It's part of, without a, any sort of sense of self. You can't function in the world or do or do anything. But of course, what they really mean and what they talk about is they talk about inflated kind of big you know, egos, but I can't remember who it came from. Maybe it came from, was it you, but Fanny? It's, but yeah. it's also this, um, is it like Freudian notion of like the super ego and ego? Yeah. Like there's there's a, there's a super ego, which is that voice inside of you, like telling you how wrong you are and everything. But but the ego is just your sense of self. And actually the problem is, is not usually an inflated. If we're just talking about the ego, it's about having a weak ego, not having a too strong ego. Like people with strong egos are amazing to work with because they have a strong sense of themselves yeah and so paradox yeah, yeah. yeah. so paradoxical as, as it sounds to really work well collectively and to embrace decentralization when that's really appropriate you have to really work deeply on your sense of self which is which is weird because we know that at a very deep level there is no fundamental separation of a human of a human self we're all deeply in, interconnected there's no hard boundary around anyone and yet part of being human is to have this sense of self so we have to sort of ride that weird paradox but this is where the the source work which is about the outward facing creative process of bringing ideas into the world meets the inner process of, of inner development and you've had and people can look up the um the living room conversation with peter koenig he's been on this on this show a while a while back where he talked about the relationship to money but the relationship to money being a way in to people's deeper sense of identity, the deepest mm. parts of who am I, the self. The self. Um, it relates to money because people externalize and project parts of themselves onto, onto money. But they can watch that other conversation to deep dive on that part. But actually, the, the process of, of um, being a good source means to strengthen the ego. Um, and that means to not externalize, you know, a small child part of yourself or a fear of being something you're afraid to be or to be or to be seen um, mm. as, but to own all of it. You know, it's quite tantric in that way to do this, to do this really yeah. well. So this is important. But I could, yeah, it's a question popping yes. for you, of course. I like, the, I like this idea really much, this idea of um, becoming friends with your ego rather than fighting against it somehow and compensating it um, and giving it also the mandatoriness to have an ego that you're 
that you manifest and that you are clear about to be a good leader. Um, it's a very nice thought. Um, nevertheless, there's a few questions, as, as you said, and there is one question from Ria, which I think fits quite nicely to what we've discussed before um, about um, the source again, and then also if, if it's toxic, let's say there is a source, non-toxic, but leaving, we have successor. You already mentioned before that there needs to be a proper handover. The question now is like the new successor brings in different kind of idea, different um, mindset, and then maybe the whole, how did Ria um, put it, the previous regime often fades away. Mm. So what is your take on this? How can you do these successions successfully and, and make sure you don't start from scratch again? Yeah, so I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of principles because I know we're short on time. There's, I really love the, the chapter in the Work Resource book about succession because it really lays out the whole thing in detail. So if you can, grab a copy, do. Uh, book plug over. <laughs> but the first thing to say is that the succession of source doesn't happen automatically when, say, a founder or a, the previous source leaves what we might think of as the organization. So when they hand over all of their roles, even if they sell their, their, their shares, they leave the board, none of those things mean there's a succession of sorts. So it has to be paid attention to separately. And in many cases, it just happens really naturally and organically. I've, had, I've explained this principle to many people over the years, and some go, oh, wow, yeah, that happened to me when I took something from someone else or that I let go of something to a successor. So it's a very natural human process, not something new that Peter Koenig has, has invented. But specifically to Ria's question, the, the fundamental thing that gets passed on in a succession is the deeper sense of the values that are being expressed. And that, so that's something that's a deeper, more foundational level than the creative vision for what's the thing we're bringing into the world or the change that we're making. So it's really natural that after a succession, the vision will naturally evolve and change because that's a new person holding it. But the red thread that can run all the way back to the beginning is the values. So that's the thing for the outgoing source and their successor to really focus on is like, how do we how are we showing up in the world? How are we holding ourselves? Um, and what happens is, is when there's a real sense between those two people, that you really that you really get this precious thing that I'm now holding. They willingly let it go, um, and the other person takes it, and both are changed in that moment. It's like a, a rite of passage where you're not the same person you were as before it. And we have many examples of that of rites of passage in our culture, but this one is a rite of passage for a creative initiative. So if you really focus on the values, then you can have that continuity and you can have make sure it's the right successor. So sometimes, you know, when things, when you lose that, when you start to see that disintegration after a founder leaves and then shortly after them, all the good people leave. And then the next thing you know, they're just trying to make the money work and survive. Uh, and they've lost the connection to purpose. Often it's because the succession hasn't really happened. Mm there hasn't been this deeper connection and this rite of, of passage. So sometimes in, in, in my work, we have to go back, sometimes even many, many years, and find where that path of succession was broken. And sometimes you, have to, you need to bring back an original founder to say, we need your guidance right now because no one else here gets what this thing is really about. And they've, they've just had their 10th workshop on co-creating the vision and values. And it, they're just coming out with generic crap like integrity and service and all that you know normal bullshit um but the source will say this is what it was about mm. and then the people who are really in the field will go oh yeah that's it and the consent comes naturally and then mm. either the source really steps back in or sometimes at that point they can say yeah i did want to hand this over and now i can do it properly and consciously and then they can hand it over to a successor hand over those values really let it go and then it goes into a new phase and it and it becomes vibrant again so yeah so hopefully that answers your question, Raya. Thank you for asking. Thank you very much. So um, there is some effort to put into a um, source succession is what I get. And uh, it needs both parties, the old and the new source, um, to work on this to make it successful. And there is one more question from Alex around um, sources. So sources, sometimes they, they take over multiple initiatives. And the question mm -hmm. now is, does it drain energy of a source to have too many, or can you scale it and delegate into independent uh, in, 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 into unlimited um, initiatives? Or mm -hmm. what's your um, experience on this? 
Yeah, my general take on this is that I think it can work fine to be the source of many things if there's one overarching unifying initiative. So really, in that sense, there is just one thing or maybe a very small number of things. But within it, there are more specific sub initiatives. So really, the, the field that you're holding is one thing. There's one overall edge to to protect and if that's the setup then they can if it's scaling then they can they can find other people who want to be specific sources in their field who maybe start those more specific projects or maybe have them handed over to them one of the things i often do with founders is is mapping out the field um, and i use the the open source software that i designed called maptio which someone might put in the chat um to map things out visually and often when you first do that the founder just appears everywhere they're the person who's the source for everything and then no wonder they're completely exhausted um and then often they say all oh, right i don't have to be holding all of these things it's like great well, mm -hmm. why don't we do some mini successions for some of these more specific things and and it needn't be big sometimes it just takes a call just to say i really want to let this go this is what this thing was about do you want to take it and they go yeah i'd love to take it great there you go done and then it eases off um so yeah there are i think probably the most iconic example is elon musk you think of all the companies he's running but perhaps in many ways elon has one overall initiative that you know spacex and tesla mm. and the rest of it is really about but probably based on a childhood sci-fi fantasy not necessarily something that adult but if any what were you going to yeah, say yeah i have another perspective on this question as well is that like from the perspective that you don't you don't really choose what to source you know like what 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 is yours to do in the world chooses you uh so if you're truly deeply listening to like what is really mine to do like kind of life will it you know the life force or or you know depending on what spiritual view you have will will choose you or it won't choose you um so kind of from that maybe a more spiritual perspective you actually can't be depleted because um because you know that 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 thing won't choose to come through you if you can't handle it or can't take it hmm. um but then of course we're not always in touch with our truth so for you know for other fears we take sometimes take on too much but that like true authentic source connection actually chooses you i'd mm. say um, thank you i know we only have nine minutes left but i have i have one question still in mind before we then get to the fade out because i've heard that we need to finish on point that's a tradition in this set in this setting so we need to um, stick to it um, and one thing is from an organizational design level what, what do I need to pay attention to, to make sure that the source can provide the vision and also keep the vision in place and make sure we don't dilute the initiatives and the creativity into something that is intangible anymore. And at the same time, allow the sources underneath to pop up and go where the passion lies to mm -hmm. fulfill the vision. Yeah, this is, this is a good topic. I'll, I'll, I'll try and give you a couple of minutes on it. because we, we don't have much time. So we another episode on it. <laughs> but yeah, but the, the first really important principle here is that there's a priority. And the priority is to the creative hierarchy. And that's the hierarchy of the global source of the whole initiative to the specific sources, and then even perhaps even more specific sources that feed from them. So there is a hierarchy of source. And that exists in any initiative. It's just a question of whether or not you, you actually look for it and make it, make it clear and work from it consciously. So my recommendation when I work on, on org design is actually start by mapping the creative hierarchy first and get clear on who's the source of what where have all these different things come from who was invited by who and what are they really trying to do here and then you see this this pattern start to emerge which can look a bit like an org chart but it's coming from a very different mm -hmm. paradigm and then any org design efforts that you that you make to introduce structure or practices around anything at all like decision making for example or governance um, all of that should be in service of helping the creative hierarchy do its work and to come to life not trying to do it the other way around which is what normally happens which is to design an organization and governance and systems and processes yeah. in the hope that good stuff will emerge from that i would say that's completely the wrong way around and takes us away from creativity um so that's the general principle but in for them for the most part is you can then once you're clear on who's sourcing what is you can ask that source what do you need to, re to realize this idea and they might go yeah we we don't know how often to meet or our meetings are a mess cool let's do some org design let's maybe introduce a rhythm and maybe some 
agile practices like Fanny's and her colleague Victor have developed some brilliant practices for teams called fractal development, which you can find online. Um, and, and that can be used, yeah, to help help people organize better. But that's the thing is you organize. It's a verb. It's a thing that you do rather than it being about creating an organization. That's the big shift. So that's how it can fit together with all design in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Um, uh, really, thank you. It was a very nice conversation. I could keep on asking you questions for the next hour. Um, so maybe we'll have another chance to go deeper into some of these topics as I find it. Um, as I said, the concept really grew, to, grew on me and I think it's a can be very powerful concept um, to keep in mind and to to just see also in, in the environment where we already see such behaviors or we, we can where we can apply um, the source concept to more explicitly to make things work. Um, nevertheless, we need to wrap it up soon. So one thing I would like to do is to, first of all, thank you for your time. It was a pleasure. Um, I think your details have also been shared or will be shared in the comments so that people can also reach out in case there is any other questions. And the other thing I would like to do is to point out the following events. And ideally, there is going to be a slide in a second. Exactly. Because we have the Modern Work Awards in 2023. The application is open now. And we also have two living room conversations, one with Christian Vandela in, um, on July 12th and one with Patrick Franzen on July 26th that are upcoming. And I would like to invite you to join. You can skin, scan the QR code um, in case you want to have more information. Um, other than that, I would also like to give you the space um, in case there's any interesting conferences, uh, other formats that you're hosting or um, other websites we should visit to learn more about the, the topics you're working on. Yeah, well, I can see the links have appeared in the in the chat. I reckon, can we use the last couple of minutes to address Gabby's question in the comments? Did you see this one, Fanny? This is oh, no, one. I have not. Oh, have any, do you think that the feminine source mm. is more potent or somehow more powerful in general than a masculine source? Thank you, Tom. Let's use the time. Yeah, yeah that sounds great. I agree. You need the to be fast. Are, <laughs> the links are in the comment. Yeah. OK, <laughs> two minutes. Um, no is the short answer. Uh, I think that they're very different. and. You can look at my article, there's four different, there's two masculine, two feminine, and you can source from like, you have usually probably have your core archetype in one or maybe two or, and some people have their archetype all over the place, but um, so it's, it's depending on where you're at, but regardless of where you have your archetype in, it's about how you source will be different and you need to complement, uh, you need to bring in subsources that bring in, um, bring in uh, the other dimensions. So for example, if you're sourcing very much from the creative feminine archetype, then you'll probably be super close to the creative vision and really be embodying that life force. But you might need to bring in more people, subsources who are good at creating that clarity and direction. And if you're in the holding masculine, maybe you're really, really good at that listening and clarifying, but you ne really need to bring in other people who are really bringing in this embodied aliveness or the executing masculine or the holding. Yeah, so I wouldn't say that um, it's different, not more potent. And that's the beauty of the masculine and the feminine, you know, like we're, they're, they're very different and that's why they complement each other so well. And what we need is, is collabor deep, deep uh, collaboration and holding out the polarities rather than saying that one is better or worse, just allowing them to be radically different. The more different we can allow them to be and collaborate, uh, the more creative potential is between the polarities. Love it. Thank you, Fanny. That's also my key takeaway. Accept the polarities and move in between and see what fits the purpose um, currently. Um, if there is a, like if there is one thing that the viewers should take away from this session from your perspective, we can share it now and then um, we close the session and are hopefully on time. So last word to you. What is the, the most important message that everybody needs to get after this? Do you want to go first, Fanny? Anything? <laughs> well, I don't know. You can go first. <laughs> All right, I can go. Um, yeah, just try putting on this different pair of glasses and first and foremost, see yourself as a source as a creative being and acknowledge yourself as a source for the things that you have started or that you have taken from someone else and then see where that process leads leads you to so that would be my yeah my key key next step yeah i really like that i think that applies really well to the masculine and feminine as well like find what makes you come most alive and start embodying and living that uh, and then go from there very good thank you so much
thank you for your time. It was a very interesting conversation. I took a lot of inspiration with me to build on in the coming days. Um, whoever also liked the conversation, please hit the um, like button and also subscribe to the channel if you want to um, join the following Living Room Conversations. And thanks also to everybody listening um, and watching and hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan, for hosting. Thank you. Ciao.